Okay, so uh, we're really diving into this Ukraine situation, you know, the whole North Korea thing. Yeah. It's like right out of a spy novel. Yeah. And we've got some South Korean intelligence reports to unpack here. Right. Which is huge because when it comes to North Korea. They're the ones who know what's up. Yeah, they're like the gold standard. Absolutely. So basically they're saying North Korean troops have been spotted in Ukraine, but, and here's where it gets interesting, they're wearing Russian uniforms and using fake IDs. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's like, are they trying to fly under the radar? Or what's the deal with that? Right, because it's not like just a simple disguise. You know, there's got to be a bigger strategy at play here. Exactly. It's yeah. not just about blending in. Yo. So what's the advantage of all this cloak and dagger stuff then? Well, think about right. what happens after a conflict, especially if there are accusations of war crimes flying around. All right. If you can't definitively prove who those soldiers were. It's like a get out of jail free card almost. Mm. Yeah, it creates a layer of plausible deniability, which makes it really hard to hold anyone accountable. Wow. So it's basically a smokescreen for potential war crimes. It's one way to look at it. And it's not just that even on a purely logistical level, just... Managing a unit of soldiers who are living under assumed identities. Oh, man. That's got to be a logistical nightmare. Talk about a security risk. Right. You've got communication issues, yeah. potential for defections. The whole thing just seems incredibly risky. You'd think the risks would outweigh the benefits in that kind of situation. You would. But then again, this is where it gets even more interesting. Our source actually suggests that some of these soldiers disguised as North Koreans Wait, what might actually be Chinese troops. Now, that's a twist I did not see coming. Yeah. Are we talking like a full-blown conspiracy theory here, or is there any actual evidence to support that claim? It's important to be clear here, this particular claim is speculative. Okay. The source even admits that it's based on conjecture and the lack of definitive proof at this point. But even as a hypothetical, it just goes to show how much we don't know about what's really going on. It's like trying to solve a puzzle, but you don't have all the pieces. Exactly. And some of the pieces might even be from a different puzzle altogether. Okay, so how do we even begin to make sense of all this then? Well, the source uses this great analogy. They compare it to listening to a symphony orchestra. Oh, okay. The information that's publicly available, it's like only hearing the bass line. You get a sense of the rhythm. Right. But you're missing all the nuance and complexity of the full piece. The melody, the harmonies, all of it. Exactly. To get the complete picture, you need to be listening for those missing instruments, those whispers of information that intelligence agencies pick up. Through their secret sources and spy gadgets and all that. Exactly. Satellite imagery signals intercepts all of it. So you're saying we're missing a big chunk of the story. We might be missing an entire movement of the symphony. And sometimes those missing pieces, those whispers of information, come from something as simple as a uniform or an ID card. Precisely those seemingly insignificant details can be incredibly revealing when you know how to interpret them in context. It's all about connecting the dots, right? Looking for those patterns that tell a bigger story. So how does this all fit into the bigger picture then? Okay. What's the strategy behind disguising troops and then like just kind of hinting at it enough to raise suspicions? Right. And our source suggests a two-pronged approach here. First, this whole drip feed of information about North Korea being involved, especially with the whole forged documents thing, it creates this narrative of Russia having to rely on foreign fighters. Which doesn't look good from a PR standpoint. Exactly. It's designed to chip away at support for Russia, so doubt among their allies. It definitely creates a sense of unease, like what else are they hiding? Right. It keeps the pressure on. But here's where it gets really interesting. The source argues that avoiding like a full-blown reveal, a smoking gun moment, you know? Okay. That might actually serve a deeper strategic purpose. I'm intrigued. Lay it on me. Think about it this way. A sudden, undeniable revelation. It might be satisfying in the short term, right? Sure. But it could also trigger a rapid escalation or give those involved an easy way to counter the narrative. So by controlling the flow of information. You keep everyone guessing. You maintain that focus on Russia's actions. And potentially, you even expose hidden alliances or dependencies that might have otherwise stayed hidden. So it becomes a way to keep the international community off balance while also applying pressure and maybe gathering more intel along the way. Exactly. It's like a high stakes game of chess. You don't want to show your hand too early. Right. You lose that element of surprise. You lose your advantage. And this approach lets them control the narrative, exploit weaknesses, potentially gain a strategic advantage in the long run. It really highlights how important it is for all of us to be careful about the information we consume. 
you know. Oh, absolutely. Especially in this age of information warfare and all that. It's more crucial than ever to question not just what we're being told, but who's telling it and what their agenda might be. Right, we can't just take everything at face value. Especially when it comes to something as complex and as consequential as an international conflict. It's about thinking critically and recognizing that we're not just passive consumers of information. You know, right. we have a responsibility to engage with it actively mm -hmm. and to be wary of those who might be trying to manipulate our perceptions. And this whole deep dive into the situation in Ukraine, it's a perfect illustration of why that's so important. Because it's messy. It's messy. Nothing is quite as it seems appearances are crafted very deliberately. And the truth, the truth is out there somewhere. It might be hidden in plain sight. But there are clues if you know where to look. Like those uniforms and forged IDs we were talking about. Exactly. They may seem like minor details, but yeah. they can unravel a much larger story if we're willing to ask the right questions and connect the dots. So with all that in mind, what does our source see as the potential end game here? Is it simply about supporting Russia's efforts in Ukraine, or are there larger objectives at play? This is where the analysis gets really interesting. They argue that the lack of a swift, decisive victory in Ukraine. Which has been pretty brutal to witness. Absolutely tragic on a human level. But they argue that it might actually serve a strategic purpose for the West. That's a bold statement considering the human cost of this conflict. Yeah. What's their reasoning there? They're thinking long term. Their argument is that a protracted conflict, while incredibly difficult in the short term, allows for continued pressure on Russia okay. economically, politically, and it provides more opportunities to expose those hidden alliances and dependencies that we were talking about earlier. So you drag it out and potentially weaken Russia's position on the global stage in the long run. That's the idea, but it's a gamble. Right? A huge gamble. A gamble that the potential long-term benefits of weakening Russia and exposing its network of support outweigh the immediate costs of a prolonged conflict. It's a complex calculation with no easy answers, that's for sure. It makes you think about the different timelines at play here. Short-term pain versus long-term gain, the immediate human cost versus potential future benefits. How do you even begin to weigh those factors against each other? It is a tough question, right? And it speaks to the really difficult choices that world leaders are grappling with. Yeah, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by it all. Absolutely. But let's bring it back to you for a second. What are your thoughts on this whole thing? How do you balance those immediate costs with the potential long-term gains? It's a lot to process, that's for sure. This conversation has really highlighted just how complex international relations can be, you know? Absolutely. And how these conflicts have ripple effects that we might not even realize. And sure. I think it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day headlines. Right. But this deep dive has really shown the importance of critical thinking. You know, hmm. taking a step back and really trying to understand the motivations behind the information we're consuming. Absolutely. We can't just be passive absorbers of information, especially now when we're bombarded with so much of it. Right. It's like drinking from a fire hose out there. Yeah. So for anyone listening, what would you say is the biggest takeaway here? What should we keep in mind as we try to make sense of these complex global events? I think the source put it best. Don't accept the easy answers. Question the narratives you're being given. Look for those hidden agendas, those little hints of information that might point to a different perspective. And maybe even question those seemingly insignificant details, right? Absolutely. Sometimes it's those little things that can unravel the whole story. Well said. This has been a fascinating discussion, really insightful. It has been a pleasure. It's given us a lot to think about for sure. And hopefully empowered you to be a bit more discerning out there. Absolutely. So until next time, everyone keep asking those tough questions, keep digging deeper, and keep exploring the complexities of this wild world we live in.